So this is essentially, um, everybody, a welcome. It, it's a, an engagement event to really give you a little bit of an opportunity to understand a little bit more about peer networks, but also to hear from a wonderful speaker in Mark Wright. I and mean, we, we are really fortunate to, to know Mark Wright and to have him come to a number of our events. Uh, and I think you'll find him really interesting and engaging. And actually, for, for um, those of you who just arrived, I think, Caroline, we, we, are, um, we are recording this session so that we can share this um, at a later date. So I hope that's OK with you all. So really what we want to do is just to say thank you to, for taking time out of your schedule. And we're going to try and make sure that you feel it's been time well spent with us this morning. OK. So just obviously welcome and scene setting, just do a little bit about um, who we are and, and what we're here about. And we are really pleased to be delivering a couple of cohorts for the Lancashire uh, Peer Networks programme. Um, I think we've, we've got a great programme lined up for you, should you decide that it's right for you and you want to sign up. So and hopefully you'll be inspired today um, and, and that's what we would like to do. So I think we've just welcomed another, another participant, which is great. So, um, Stephen, I think just for you, we've, we've literally just started. We were waiting for people to arrive. So um, we've just started. We've just done the welcome. And actually what we're going to do now is um, just give you a little bit of a challenge, a little bit of something interactive for today. We're going to ask you to take part as we go through today in the M&Ms challenge. So throughout this session, either side of Mark and Kevin is going to bring you some uh, information and, and some real um, insight into unconscious bias and scaling up challenges. Um, we're going to give you a challenge and to say um, how many M&Ms are in the jar. It's a little bit of fun, but there's an underlying message here. So I don't want you to say anything out loud. OK, don't want you to post anything in the chat yet. OK, I'd like you to take a look at this, this pot here. We've got some measurements for you. We've got 14 and a half centimetres high. We've got 11 and a half centimetres across the top. Um, or it's 5.7 inches tall and 4.5 inches wide for those of us that prefer the old fashioned stuff. And you can tell the grey hairs will give that away. 30 seconds to think it through. Um, and then just private message Kevin. OK, so this is the shush bit. Don't say anything out loud, private message Kevin with the number of M&Ms you think are in that jar, okay? <laughs> Vitri, I think you're, you're already enjoying the challenge by the look of you. <laughs> Kevin will tell me when he's had the replies from you all. You heard from everybody now, Kevin? Yeah, I think so. Excellent. So, Without any more messing around and further ado, that, that one of the real key um, joys of today is to be able to introduce you to Mark Wright, who's the founder director of Climb Online. Um, as I said, we're really lucky to, to know Mark. And, and actually, he said to us, he's seeing more of us than he's seeing of his family. So make of that as you will um, today. So I'd like to hand over now to Mark, who is going to um, tell you all about himself and his journey and hopefully inspire you. Uh, there will be some questions and answers at the end. So hold the questions uh, and for Mark at the end of his session. Thank you very much, Louise and uh, Kevin for having me back and everyone for um, taking the time out of your busy afternoons. I know as life goes a bit back to uh, a more normal circumstance, we used to get hundreds of people on these at, at no notice. And now people have got in life events, people are back in the office and, and uh, life is picking back up to its busy normal self. So it's not lost on me, everyone giving up their time here to join me this afternoon. But um, I really uh, wanted to thank Bismart for having me back. Like I said, uh, unfortunately, my family all live in Australia, as you can tell by my accent. So I've been doing more of these business talks and hanging out with these guys and seeing my own family in the last two years. But this is a topic I'm very, very passionate about. I wanted to spend 40 minutes with you guys this afternoon to talk about business, which is my true love in life. For the last, I would say, 30 years, I've studied this subject uh, like nothing else. I, I, I've read about every great business, every great business person, and uh, I love this. And, and really, my conferences, ClimbCon, my conference, and the seminars that I give, we're normally talking to um, sometimes thousands, um, uh, tens of thousands in some cases, or certainly hundreds of people. This afternoon, there's a very small group of us. 
And where that's really lucky is for the last five, 10 minutes of today's session, you're going to have an opportunity to ask me, Kevin, Louise, whatever it is you have burning questions about your business, your sector, digital marketing, whatever it is, wherever it is, I can help you in your business. Write your questions down as we go along and ask me your questions at the end. I'd love to answer absolutely uh, anything you've got. So let's do it. Uh, let's talk about business 101. So I'm going to give you a quick background about my background. What I say in business is only take advice from a mentor, a coach, or someone who is an expert in the area that they are preaching to you on. So I'm going to first of all show you my credentials so you know that I'm worthy of listening to. I'm going to talk a bit about Apprentice. That's the thing everybody asks me about it. So I've done a lot of things in my career, but I did a little TV program um, called The Apprentice, which uh, uh, meant that I have a business partner now called Alan Sugar, and people like me to talk talk about that, believe it or not. Uh, over the last uh, 10 years uh, being in business and owning my own advertising agencies, I've worked with tens of thousands of the top business people in the world and some of the biggest companies in the world. Some of the people I do marketing for, you would have heard of their names like Emirates, TikTok, um, Be Wiser Insurance, uh, CV Library, these types of companies. And I've put together their digital marketing strategies. But what I've learned from them is what to do in business and what not to do in business. I've also been mentored by two billionaires and I've made a list. I believe that success is like a recipe for baking a cake. And I've gone away and made a list of all the lessons I've made from my billionaire mentors. And I've also made a list of things not to do because I believe if you know what not to do in business and what to do, you, you have to hit your goals. So uh, I'm going to talk about some companies that are doing some good things. And then, like I said, I'm going to give you an, 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 um, an opportunity for five or 10 minutes to ask me any business questions you've got. You can even ask me questions about The Apprentice. And if the phone rings, do we really have 20 minutes to get ready, uh, which is the number one question I've got in these talks over the years. So my favorite topic, myself, as you can tell, uh, my background is uh, I'm from Australia. I came over here in 2012 with 172 pounds in my back pocket. Uh, I was living in a backpacking hostel called the White Ferry House and working at one of the biggest digital marketing agencies in the UK. Um, uh, 500 employees, 72 officers. I knew I was good at digital marketing, but I was working in a massive organization that I felt I could do things better. I didn't agree with the way the company I was working in was treating their staff. I didn't agree with the way they were treating their customers. And we have a saying in Australia, you know, don't get bitter, get better. I put together a business plan for what I would believe would be a digital marketing agency with a real difference. And I took it to four banks. But because I'm not from this country, um, they didn't give me a loan. They wouldn't even open an account for me. So I tried out for the TV show, The Apprentice in 2014. I was one of 75,000 people that tried out for the show in series 10. Um, I was uh, selected in the final. I went from 75,000, 50,000, 20,000, 10,000 uh, into 1,000 people into the final tryouts onto series 10, which I won. I became Lord Sugar's uh, 10th business partner um, from the series of the show. I'm one of only four business partners left with him. My company, Climb Online, is the most successful business to be founded by an apprentice winner. Uh, we have offices uh, here in the UK, um, like uh, you know, I named some of the um, companies we've done marketing for. And what that's allowed me to do is be business partners with a billionaire and a successful businessman for seven years and learn intricately how to structure deals, how to run an organization and how to scale an organization. And uh, I'm going to take you through that today. So that's a bit about me. Uh, People say to me on the street, you wouldn't believe how many people say this to me on the street. Oh, it's easy. I could do it if I'd won The Apprentice or you're just lucky because you won The Apprentice. Well, 75,000 people tried out for The Apprentice and anyone's welcome to try it out to The Apprentice. But like I said, there's only uh, four or five of us left with Alan Sugar today. And what I didn't realize was when I went on the show, Series 10, 8 million people with 7.8 million people on average watch each episode of uh, my series of The apprentice and what that meant was two things yes we got a lot of attention I got a lot of attention I went from uh, 93 followers on Twitter I was very popular to 150,000 followers across all platforms LinkedIn Twitter Facebook all the rest of it I got my first trolls 
people telling me they wish I would die and I wish, wish I they would kill myself and all of this stuff. And on the first day of opening my company, we had 7,000 leads. So I went from no one knowing who I was to getting load, asked for loads of selfies each day, getting trolled online. And my company went from opening stores and we were setting up our first computer and desk to having tens of thousands of leads. We had industry haters. We, I figured out for the first time when you find some success, your competition don't like that because you're taking customers away from them. So my uh, competition was saying uh, bad things about me. People I'd never met before were saying bad things about me. And I started getting negative press. I also got sued in our very first quarter. So there was lots going on. I was famous, quote unquote, for the first time. I was starting a startup business for the first time. I had a multi-billionaire business partner for the first time. And there was a lot of pressure uh, on me. But like I said, my, my company, Climb Online, has become the most successful business to be founded by an apprentice winner. And it wasn't all easy. And that's the, really what I'm trying to get across today is I think it's, it's sometimes easy for us to see people that go on game shows like The Apprentice or Dragon's Den and think that everything's made up for them. But I've put a lot of work in behind the scenes over the course of 11 year career, public speaking, writing books, doing podcasts, doing talks like this. Uh, and The Apprentice is a very small string to my bow. I believe that to be successful in business as an entrepreneur, you have to be an expert in whatever it is you do. No matter the industry or the sector that you go into, to be successful, you have to be an industry expert. And that's why I went on The Apprentice. I felt I was very good at what I do, did, which is digital marketing. And the only recipe, to, I believe, to making a company get to the point of being super successful is being well known. Starbucks does not have the best coffee. McDonald's does not make the best burger, okay? There is a reason why Richard Branson flies around the world, bars himself into space, flies air balloons around the world in 80 days and all of this stuff. Business is about being known. If you can become an expert at what you do and be well known for what you do, you get attention. Attention leads to results in business. And I understood that. And that's the reason I decided to go on to The Apprentice because I knew I needed money. I knew I needed mentorship and I knew I needed attention. That's the keys to success in business. If you can find a good mentor or coach, you can get the right level of financing and you can get customers to know who you are, you're pretty much home and hosed. So first year in my business, Climb Online, we turned over 1.7 million pounds. Uh, first and only apprentice winner to turn over a million in year one. First and only apprentice winner to make a profit in year one. And my company has what they call disrupt the digital marketing sector. Uh, and we've, we've won a load of awards for culture and those sorts of uh, bits and pieces, which I'll touch on later in my presentation. But today, I don't want to really focus too much on me. I want to focus on you and your business and how we can take your company to whatever it is, whatever your wildest dreams and goals are for your company. I want to make that happen. So first, I think if you can avoid the mistakes, if you can avoid the pitfalls, success is easy from that point. And here's a list of the mistakes that I feel most what I call bedroom DJs or uh, startup companies make as they get their company going. So the first one, and you will have felt this or seen this in some of the businesses that you've either worked in, been an employee in, or you might have felt it in your own business, and it's operating too lean starting with not enough employees, not enough financing in your business, whatever it is, trying to do it on a shoestring. And what happens is you're scared to make decisions because things cost money. And that money, uh, if you don't have it, the right level of financing, you won't make the right decisions to take the business forward. So starting with the right level of financing in your company and a business plan is essential. You have to know where you're going. You have to have goals. You have to have a business plan with a vision, but you have to have the right level of financing. And some financial planning at the start of your business plan will really make sure you have the right level to get the business to where it needs to go. Focusing on turnover and not profit. Uh, this is one of my favorite ones. They say turnover uh, is vanity and profit is sanity. Why in the UK they have these business awards that ask you what your turnover is, is, is craziness to me because 
Well, there's so many businesses out there at Companies House that have huge levels of sales, huge levels of turnovers, yet they're going bankrupt. They're going illiquid because their business is going broke from not watching their margin, uh, not having the right level of profits built into their sales. And all that means is their costs explode. Yes, their sales are going up, but they don't actually have a business. Understanding what your gross margin is and knowing how much you need to sell and how much out of that money you need to keep to the business to be successful is essential. Uh, and it, it comes back to understanding your numbers, having a, a P&L in your account and review in your business and reviewing that regularly, which we'll touch on again. And my biggest mistake was not employing the right staff in my business when I got started. I was a bit cheap when I got started. I got my investment from Lord Sugar and my focus was on keeping as much of that investment as possible. So what I started to do was hire cheap employees, commission only 16 and 18,000 pound salaries because I didn't want to spend any of my investment money. But what that meant is I hired under, under trained, under accredited people who gave a poor service to my customers. And that led to complaints, that led to churn in my business, and that led to uh, created issues that I couldn't reverse. So hiring the right founding team in your business and having the right advice about you is so, so important. I would rather have less staff now at the right level than more staff. Again, saying, oh, I have this many staff or I have this level of turnover. These are the business things that people make mistakes at networking events, telling people how many staff they have and what their turnover is. That's the wrong things to focus on. We want to make money, we want to make margin, and we want to have the right people around us giving us the right advice. And it comes back, you know, there's so many business owners I speak to that don't even have a board. They don't have a board in their business, so they don't have monthly board meetings. They don't have any non-exec directors or people around them advising them. And I said, why don't you have a board or board meetings? Oh, it's just me. I'm a one-person I'm a one -person business, or I just have a 10-person business. Every company needs a board of directors. If you don't know, you need advice from the right people. I'm gonna go into mentor, I'm gonna go into coaching, I'm gonna go into business groups because there's so many free service and groups available that will give you the tools to be successful and you have to implement them. Having a board has been the best thing I've ever done in my company. People to keep me accountable. Accountability, What we have a saying, we have a thing, a poster on our wall in our office, which says, what gets measured gets achieved. What gets measured gets achieved. If you don't know where the business is going and you've got nobody holding you accountable, you can float from week to week and month to month and never achieve anything in your industry or business. Every time I go to my board meeting, I know my board members are gonna say, did you do those five items we discussed last month? Yes, I am. And it's the same as my mentors, holding me accountable, creating a plan and making sure we stick to the deadlines that we agree on. And this is a big one. Business owners that fail you to lead and delegate effectively. This happens when you start in your bedroom like I did and you build up into an organization. You say that, oh, no one can do it as good as I can, or I want to make sure it gets done correctly. But as a business grows, there's just too many duties on a daily basis for you to do yourself or check yourself. So it's really important that you trust in other people and you don't say things like, no one can do it as good as I can. That's a, that's a nonsense that business owners believe about themselves. The truth is if you're hiring correctly and you're training the people around you correctly, they can do things better than you because they have more time and the, and the attention to detail to focus on it. So delegating effectively will create growth in your business and take that pressure off you. Any business owner goal should be to make yourself redundant. I'll say that again. Any big business owner's goal is to make yourself redundant. You wanna be creating jobs and, and processes all around you to make sure that there's someone to do everything and, and there's a process for everything. Because when someone comes to invest or buy your business, if you're doing too much as the business owner, you kill the value of your business. Your business is effectively worth nothing because you're doing too much. And that's something that we always want to be working towards. In your first year, that's not going to be possible. In the second year, it's not going to be possible. But it's something you've constantly got to be working towards is getting yourself out of the business and working on the business. I hate that saying, but it's so true. You have to be always looking out, thinking, if I was going to buy my own business, 
What would it be worth? And it's a really powerful question to ask yourself because if you're raising the invoices in zero or, or, or whatever it is, um, if you're doing the reports to the customers, you're doing all the quoting, you're doing all the sales, anyone that comes into your business is gonna know that you've bought yourself a job and you, haven't, you, you don't own a business. So it's constantly thinking, am I making myself redundant every single day through training and systems and having no sales division? Again, a massive one that, that drives me crazy with people that I mentor and work with. They say to me, my industry doesn't need sales. I, to this day, after working with hundreds of businesses, never met a company that doesn't need a sales division. When I'm sat with you now doing this talk, I have eight people on the road selling for my digital marketing agency. I have three selling for my PR agency, one for my property business, okay? I have people on the road right now. So whilst I'm sitting with you working here, I'm still making money in my company. When you're sitting here with me, who's selling your business right now? Think about that. When you're laying in bed at night, is your business making money? Whenever you're in a meeting, you need a way of generating revenue and generating profits constantly. The key is systems and the key is people, but having marketing and sales is so, so important. The average successful business in the UK spends 11% of its turnover on marketing, 11%. If you're spending under that, you'll probably say to me that you've got low leads or not enough sales. Well, if you're not spending the right amount of money on marketing, you're not gonna have the right amount of sales. So making sure your marketing budget is in the right place, a place, 11%, and that you've got a sales team, even if that's outsourced or freelance to start with until you're in a position to bring that in-house. And this is a big one. And this is something that I've really worked on on myself and the people that I work with. And it's a lack of self-belief and ability to think big. When I've met really, really successful entrepreneurs and business people, my first thought is when I've sat down with a meeting in them, and this is true, it's how unimpressive they are. You realize when you meet someone you've thought your whole life, this person, oh, I've seen them on the news, I've read their book, I've listened to their podcast, and you meet them, they, you realize that most people are just like you. No one is better than you, no one is smarter than you, the only difference between someone where you are and where you want to go is the ability to think about being there and believe it is for you, thinking big and thinking it's for you and believing in yourself. There's almost like this guilt surrounded by uh, us business owners where we don't believe success is for us, that we don't deserve it, we shouldn't be where we are, or we got lucky by having the business and the profits that we have today. You need to look in the mirror and understand that you are a great person and you do deserve to be where, uh, where you are and where you're going because the people are there are no better than you. And that's been probably one of the, the greatest things I've taken away from meeting a lot of successful people is just realizing we're all the same. It's that dedication to, to think big and stay consistently after your goals until you get there. Um, Money mistakes. Well, we've spoken about the turnover being high and the profits are low. I can't drill that in enough. Make sure you're focused on the margin. Whenever I meet a business person, my, my first question is, what's the key to business? And they say some nonsense. Oh, it's the customers. Oh, it's my uh, product is revolutionary. It's going to change the world. I'm going to say it again. What's the key to business? The key to business is to make money. Because before you can help a customer, before you can have a re revolutionary product, you've got to have money to turn the lights on in the office. You need to have money to pay the bills, the wages, the salaries, the software costs, and there's a lot of those, okay? So the number one key to any business is to make a profit. After that, you have your vision and your, your goals as your company and your business plan. The next one is the profits are healthy, but you become too scared to spend. You get paralyzed in your own success. I've worked with a lot of business owners who have a bit of success, say they get to a million with, a, I don't know, 150K EBITDA. And then they say, oh, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that new product. I'm not going to upgrade our current product. They start getting paralyzed in their own success because by the time they've realized where they've got to, they're now second guessing their own qualities of how they got to where they are and then they're too scared to make the decisions to get to the next level in their business. 
If you start to get paralyzed by fear and overanalyze decision makings in your business, your business will die on the vine. Okay, you'll paralyze yourself. If it feels good in the gut, if it makes sense with your board and, and your senior leadership team, make the decision. Okay, make decisions quickly, get into deals quickly, get into situations quickly. You can make changes once you're in there, but don't start to overanalyze your business success once you get there and rely on the numbers. A business is so easy to run from a PL. If you know your numbers, and you're looking at a PL regularly. I look at a PL on a daily basis. That's a bit OCD for a lot of business owners, particularly before you're probably over a million quid EBITDA. Definitely weekly, 100% monthly. But we still live in the world in the UK here where some people just look at a PL once a year before they file it at company's house. You can't run a business by looking at a PL on a yearly basis. Because by the time you find a cost that's got away from you, you find a customer that the margin is costing you too much money, it's too late. If you spot something on a daily or a weekly basis, you can change it quickly. It has no effect in the business. The numbers are there to tell you what's wrong in your business and what's right. And if you let the numbers do the talking, you cannot fail. I think if you're reviewing a PL in your business on a monthly basis, the business cannot fail. In the UK, almost 90% of businesses fail in five years, 90%. And I think it's through a lack of knowledge, a lack of coaching, a lack of mentoring, and a lack of financial understanding. Because by the time you've read the numbers, the business has failed. If you have the right people around you and you read the numbers re regularly, you can't fail. I think it's so lazy that businesses fail because no business should fail. A failing business just means you haven't had the right information. So my game is giving you the right information. Um, yeah, and, 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 and watching the costs. I'm a bit crazy about the costs in my business and in my personal life. They say that, you know, the famous saying, small holes sink big ships. Uh, I love this story about American Airlines. Every time you fly with business or first class with American Airlines, they give you seven olives. When you get on, you got your champagne and you sell seven olives. They cut the olive quota back from each person getting seven to six. And they saved over 110,000 pounds on a yearly basis. 110,000 pounds from one olive per customer getting cut out of their uh, first and business class flights. So I would say, what's your one olive? What's that one area of your business, that DocuSign contract that you forgot about? The, the business Dropbox subscription you've got where, you know, the, the, the premium one will do, you don't need the business one. If you go through each line of your P&L, there'll be areas in your business where you're overspending, you've forgotten about subscription costs, uh, or you can tighten the budget. Growing the sales consistently is important, definitely. You, you must grow the sales to grow a business. But as you grow those sales, don't forget to watch the costs. And, and no management accounts. You have to have management accounts in your business. You have to have management information. I mean, if I'm to summarize the biggest impact I do when I go in and work with a, a company, and I know Kevin does this as well, it's so simple. You go in, there'll be no management accounts, there'll be no board of directors, and there'll be no mentor or coaching going on. It's like, well, guys, how can you expect to go anywhere if you don't know where you've been? If you don't know the management information to review the business, I can't even help you. So, you know, I, I'm just trying to get going in your mind is, do you have a board of directors? Do you have management accounts? Are you part of a business or networking group? If the answers are no to that, this has been the best bloody uh, Zoom call you've ever done in your life because that will change your business straight away. That will change your journey straight away. I, I can't believe that people like BizSmart and stuff do these events because the, it's, it's crazy to me that there's so much support available and people don't take it up and then still complain their business is not successful. So cultural business mistakes. Well, if you show me a good business, I'll show you a good business leader. You show me a bad business, I'll show you a bad leader. If you start with yourself and take absolute responsibility for where your company is and where it's going, your business really stands a chance. If you've got stagnated growth in your company, there's uh, pretty much a 99% chance you're doing too much. 
Uh, if you go into a business where they've stayed small for a long period of time, they say, oh, I've been a small business for 15 years. That worries me because why have you stayed small for 15 years? Unless, okay, that's your goal is to stay small. But if you're trying to scale and you're staying small, it's generally because there's someone in the leadership doing far too much and creating a bottleneck in their business. And you have to create a brand, not a business. When you buy a burger and, or, or you buy a Big Mac, Okay, when I, I start going to other coffee shops and saying, uh, uh, can I get a grande latte? And they say that's a Starbucks thing. It's so ingrained in my head, the branding of McDonald's, the branding of Apple. I've got a Steve Jobs on here because I'll speak about him at any opportunity. But great businesses create brands because brands make their customers feel something. Okay, the, 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 the top search on Google this month for PPC is not PPC in the UK. It's paid climber. Paid climber is climb online's paid ads search. People now are searching for paid climber, social climber, um, organic climber, which is climb online terms for what we call our products. We don't call it PPC. We don't call it SEO. Everything has a name like climb, climb online, paid climber. What does your business, what are your products called? They're not called like everyone else, are they? Because then you just become like everyone else. You have to think differently to stand out from the crowd with your brand, making sure you brand your products and services and you get what you tolerate. You really do get with what you tolerate with your employees, with your supply chain, with your customers. If you see something that's not right, it might be a report that's going to a customer. It might be a, a, a job that one of your staff did for your customers and something's not right. Are you gonna say something or are you gonna let it go out so you don't offend your employee. I call it giving tacit approval, which is something I don't, I don't tolerate. If I hear something or see something which is not to the standards I hold myself to or my company, I pull it up straight away. The best thing you can ever do for employees is not be their friend. It's be their coach or their mentor and their leader. You don't want your uh, employees to leave your tutelage and say you're a nice person, a nice guy, a nice lady. You want them to say they learned a lot. And that's a mistake that business owners make all the time, trying to be friends with everyone and their business goes down the toilet. We're not friends here. We're friends with our business. Our job is to grow our business, make our customers happy and to make money. Okay. And the way we do that is being honest to ourselves and honest to our employees. When they do good work, tell them. When they do bad work, tell them and show them why it's bad work and show them what good work looks like. That's what a real business leader is. They don't give tacit approval. They're honest, they're tough, and they're relentless with their feedback, truthful with their feedback. Challenge yourself. Next time you see something that's not right in your business, stop it straight away. Say, I'm not happy about that. I prefer it done like this. It feels a bit funny the first time, but your business and your customers will thank you for it. Um, so every business needs sales. Every business needs marketing. We know that. Don't worry too much about the ROI on the marketing. Um, my customers say to me all the time, "What's for every one pound I spend, how many pounds am I getting back? We work in eyeballs. Do you think that Kazoo is able to understand how many uh, ROIs they're getting from all the ca cabs they've wrapped in London or the t-shirts they sponsor in the Premier League or whatever it might be. Great businesses understand that if one person sees your brand that didn't know about you before, they can now buy from you in the future. So create a budget in your P&L for marketing. And when something doesn't work, that's fine. Shift the budget around. Never save money in your P&L from your budget. Continue to invest it, but invest in new channels and know your value. Don't undercharge. Just because you're in Lancashire, you should be charging what people do in, in London. I don't understand this theory of, oh, we don't charge London prices. We'll more fool you. More fool you for not. Always charge what you're worth. By putting your prices down and saying something like, we don't charge London prices, that's crazy to me because all of a sudden you're in a way saying, we're not as good as the people in London. Because when people take pride in telling me that, they almost use it as a USP and say, we don't charge London prices. I say, well, I don't want to use you then. 
you're not for me because I want to work with the best people and the best people charge what they're worth. I want the personal trainer who charges the most. I want to charge, I want to go to the hairdresser who's the best hairdresser. You, you can tell this is done by the best hairdresser, okay? Uh, you've got to have the confidence to charge more. There's study after study after study that show if you have a successful product and you put the price up, the sales generally go up. When you put the prices down, the sales go down. Customers associate success with value, okay? That's why everything is good, costs money. So know your value. Don't be afraid to tell people what you, your value is and charge more. It comes back to the other point about self-belief, confidence, confidence in your business, but it also the confidence that you give people around you. Hold your prices only discount uh, every so often. Set your minimums high. Um, and this is a lot for service or B2B businesses. Uh, and, and we call it in our business, the 400s. Our minimum fee for a small customer is a 400. They're the worst customers. They're the ones that want the most work. They complain the most. You, when you work with bigger customers, bigger deals, it actually gets easier. And that was painful when I found that out. I realized I own a property business. The paperwork for a 200,000 pound buy to let is the same paperwork for a 2 million. The legal fees are the same. The forms are exactly the same. So why don't we just start thinking bigger and doing bigger deals? Because we know the bigger customers make more money, the bigger deals make more money, and it's the same or less amount of work. But dealing again in the smaller customers, the smaller deals, it's generally more work, more ag, and the same amount of risk. You can go broke from a, a, a small deal the same as you can a big deal. If I'm gonna go broke, I'm gonna go broke, let me tell you. And don't be afraid to get rid of people out of your customers. If you've got a painful customer, get rid of them. If they're causing hassle, they're taking too much time. Time is the ultimate resource in life of money. If you've got a, if you've got a bad customer, You've got a bad friend, you've got a bad family member, they're taking you down, they're taking your business out, get rid, go on, see you later. We now don't work with you anymore because you're taking too much of my time and focus away from achieving my goals and taking my business to where I need to go. Uh, if you're going to think, think big. Perception is reality. Check, work on your mindset through goals, affirmations, mentoring, coaching to make sure you know who you are and where you're going and believe it is for you. And I do this thing called smelling, smelling the leather. I go and stay in hotels that are ridiculous. OK, this won't work for everyone. OK, I make appointments and go and look like around houses I cannot afford. I just want to feel and smell what that house smells like. You know, what does a 10 million pound house look like on the inside? Wow, imagine having a pool. Imagine having a three level thing. I go and sit in a Rolls Royce and feel the carpet and I smell the success. And what it does is it drives my mind to a place where I believe it is for me. I can feel and I smell the success. When I was a cold caller, I used to go and eat my lunch. I used to go to Pret. Now the founder of Pret's a good friend of mine, so it's kind of ironic. But I go, I went go to Pret, sit in the park, and I'd look at the um, at the Lamborghini dealership, and I would see people going in for their appointments, and I would imagine I was going in for my appointment for my Lamborghini, and that's got what got me through being a cold caller and having that terrible job and getting up the ranks of that job. So whatever it works for you in here, because you will have days of low motivation low self-belief, low determination. And that's fine. That's what everyone goes through. You go on Instagram, you think everyone's a bloody multimillionaire and a supermodel and has a super yacht and a Lamborghini. It's not true. The people that do that on uh, Instagram are generally poor and they're also got poor a lot, in a lot of areas, trust me. Uh, you want to focus on yourself. Don't worry about where anyone else is in their journey. You focus on you and your business alone. And it's okay to have ups and downs on that journey because let me tell you, when you're starting a business or scaling a business, there's actually more downs than ups. There's actually more downs than ups. But on the days where they're up, boy, do they make up for all those downs. And if you put the right people around you, there's less downs, they're easier because the best thing I have about being in business groups and knowing people like Kevin and Louise is when you call someone from a business group, 
or your mentor and you say, this happened today and you might be so stressed thinking it's coming to the end of your business. It's going to take you under. And they say, been there 20 times before. You do this, this and this, you email this person, you call this person and it's fixed. Why would you not have a mentor when it's that, when it's that easy? It doesn't make sense to me. So lessons from billionaires. Like I said, success is like a recipe with a cake. We just need the ingredients. So here's my ingredients. Take them or not. Success isn't for everyone. So number one, get a mentor. Have a mentor. Have And a, what is a mentor? A mentor is someone that has been through the experience that you're current, currently going through. They've been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. They've achieved the success of what you're looking to achieve yourself. It might be in your industry, might be in your current field, whatever. You can find mentors all around you. Business groups like this on LinkedIn, at our business networking events. I'm dyslexic. I can't read and write. And on average, the, the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies read on average one book a week. If you want to earn more, you've got to learn more. And when I heard this, it was a huge shock because I'd never read a book before, but I started listening to audio books and they've completely changed my life because I find them really easy to listen to. I find them really easy to retain. I change my topics from business, fitness, digital marketing, whatever it might be. I listen to something different every week and I've tripled my income every year since I've listened to audio books. I've tripled my income every year since I've listened to audiobooks. If you want to earn more, you've got to learn more. So whatever sector you're in, start by reading a book on it, start by listening to audiobooks. And I think most people fail in business. We spoke about that 90% that fail in, in, um, in the five years. And I can understand why. We, uh, we've touched on a lot of the reasons, not knowing the numbers, not having a business group, not having a mentor. We know all that. We're going to do all of that. So we're not in that group anymore. But I think actually the main reason that a lot of businesses fail and a lot of business owners go back into employment or whatever is they just give up, essentially. They don't have the right tools. They don't have the right people around them. And they just give up um, because the first two years, the failure rate is high. And then it dramatically extends the longer uh, between the five years. And I think it just... It gets too hard for too long. So 90%, I believe, of success is consistently showing up. No matter what's going on in your life and business, turning up every day with the right attitude and just doing the best you can. That goes a long way. You don't need a much more than that with just a good attitude, a smile on your face and the ability to, to learn and keep going because it's resilience over a sustained period that, that generates the most success being diligent with your time, be, be known for being hard to get a hold of. Don't sit in meetings for meetings sake. Make sure there's not met too many people in meetings and make sure meetings don't go over 45 minutes. Amazon has the two pizza rule. A lot of big organizations have similar where there's either no chairs in the meeting room or a limited amount of people or whatever. But because of the use of technology and how great this stuff is, it's so easy to sit meeting after meeting and finish the day between just doing emails and meetings and actually not achieving anything. So write down at the start of the day, be it online or with a list, what you want to achieve and write down at the end of the day, have you achieved those things? Uh, being diligent with your team uh, time is, is so important. Uh, birds of a feather flock together. If you hang around with losers, you become a loser. Uh, you are an average of the five people you hang around the most. So the people I hang around, boy, they're successful. They make me feel like, you know, I'm a pauper, which is great because every time I'm around them, they're talking about things that I'm interested in. They believe in my goals and ambitions and they're dragging me forward. If you're hanging out with people covered in tattoos, in 18 months time, you're going to have a lot of tattoos. That's just, that's just how nature works. And Kevin's going to talk about accents and this stuff that really excites me after, after my presentation. But the, your surroundings, the way you present yourself and who you hang around with has so much of a bearing on your success. Regardless of what you think, there's still a lot of unconscious bias and perception of people in, in business. So how we present ourselves, what comes out of our mouth 
and who is around us will determine how far we go in our business. And having laser focus, having goals, sticking on that track until you achieve your goals. So I've fired a lot at you there, and I know it's a, it's a small group today, so I wanted to forget about me for once, uh, focus on the business stuff, and give you a chance to ask me um, some questions about whether it's about yourself and your journey, The Apprentice, whatever it might be, uh, but I'd love to have any, any personalized questions from you guys. Fantastic, thanks, Mark. I, I always love listening to Mark. It's always a challenging presentation, and I mean that in the most positive way. You know, challenging you to think differently and pick up some of the the nuggets. And and goodness knows how many times I've heard Mark say this, and I still pick up new nuggets. <laughs> so it's always great. Um, but as, but it's always challenging. And I think that's that's one of the key things that um, we need to take away from this is is to challenge yourself. And part of peer networks is really about having those challenges, being prepared to challenge and be challenged, um, and really think differently about your business. So. Mark, do you want to just stop sharing your screen and then we yes. can, everybody can see each other? That'd be great. Thank you. Brilliant. So we have a very nice, small, select group of people here today. You've got the chance to ask Mark any questions you would like. So fire away. Victory. Okay, mm. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. That's very, very interesting, really. Um, you know, I'm... I'm, but my might be the baby of the group. Uh, obviously, we are just started. Um, the company started in um, January this year. Uh, oh. It's uh, three owners of us um, come together, um, trying to make a difference. Uh, I'm one of the owners, and I'm also the operation um, directors. So I'm dealing with you know the operational side, the staff, and everything's like that. Now um, we are a, um, a children home provider. And uh, I don't know if anyone's kind of uh, familiar with a kind of a care area and stuff like that. Um, staff is a problem. Uh, you mentioned a bit about staff there, but it's even more so in, in a children care um, kind of provision, especially the, um, the registered man, you know, the manager who actually run the homes. And they're very protective of their kind of area. Um, you know, they, they, they're like gold dust they think they are the best since the slice of bread they run their home the way they wanted to run it so what they what i found is i don't come from a care background i come from a finance background so you know and staff development so that is my forte i develop people i uh, you know i i deal with finance i look at money and margins yeah. and all that kind of things so when i come um meet with these people they automatically think that I don't know what I'm talking about for, for a start. Yeah. Uh, you're not from a care background. What do you know? And I, I found that is a very kind of belittling. Um, and, you know, because they, they think that they know everything that they need to know about running the um, kind of the homes. But they forget that I'm the owners <laughs> of yeah. this company. I'm, you know, I'm the operation and directors. So, but they don't see it that way. And how do you actually get that challenge how you actually kind of you know go past that and because obviously i'm quite kind of stubborn i'm like i don't want to prove myself i'll just show you what i'm good at well, you uh, know? do you have anyone on your do you have anyone on your board um of the well, first question is do you have a board second one is anyone on your board a, an expert in the care sector Yes, yes. Okay. So the other uh, director, which is the clinical director, she is, she done this, she's a registered mental health nurse for 20 years. So she had homes before. So she's, she's kind of like, but the problem is she's not a people person. So you kind of like, well, let's just cut, cut them off. But I'm not like that. You know, I work with the people. I work with, I understand that people has their own view, that they has, that's how I roll. And I had the other two directors. One is the strategic side of it he's good with you know business strategic how are we going to go forward we already got our three five year plan okay. but again he's not a people person he yeah. will shout at everybody and everybody you know so the only person that can actually handle him is just this two board director because everyone else will be running away or sue us for 
Okay. Kind of so uh, to, to answer your question, um, is everything in sales, what it sounds like your problem is, is, is sales because there's, there's the sliced bread and uh, selling yourself and your business to uh, potential uh, customers. I'm using the word customers broadly because I know you're in the care sector. Uh, it comes back to credibility. Okay, so people buy from businesses when they're credible. That's why businesses apply for awards. That's why they're with uh, accrediting and awarding bodies. And that's why you have people on your boards or around you that have a, a industry experience. So even though the person who's on your board is a care expert and they're not a people person, could you have some sort of sales collateral or presentation you could do at, at the meeting with the care home, which is, I don't know, a written statement or a video from your board director to say, I'm a mental health care expert for 20 years experience because all the per if, if they think they're the best in sliced bread, your job is to show that your business has years of experience. And it's like when you go and pitch for investment, you always talk about how many years of experience your board has. And it's like, we have 150 years experience. It's total nonsense. But all you're trying to give is credibility that you know what you're doing and that you're a specialist in the sector. So can you apply it and win any awards? Are you a part of all the accrediting uh, bodies of the care sector. And that's really, really important. It might sound crazy to you, but I don't know much about digital marketing. It's, and I own a massive, massive digital marketing agency. I was just a really good salesperson. So my job was when I first started my company, I went and got all the top accreditations with Google, Facebook, being all of the search engines. I had people with years of experience around me from the sector and I made videos and statements for them endorsing me. And when I went and met a company and they say, how much do you know about digital marketing? I say, not that much, but look at the team and the business that I have around me. And it worked very well. And I know care is a different sector, but it's just about, like I was saying in my presentation, making sure you have the right people around you. And once you have one or two key customers, getting testimonials from them. So if you have another care home saying, you know, I was when I met um, when I met these guys, they were a bit, I wasn't sure, but it's completely changed my business and the people they're sending me are excellent, whatever, whatever, whatever. So testimonials in that sector are so important. Hopefully that yeah. helps. No, I think um, I might didn't actually kind of explain it uh, correctly there the business is not the problem we have business right left and center um it's more the staff um you know because they think they are the experts in in the industry but they they kind of like finding if you're not from the care background then you are not worthy uh, so how do you because obviously you said you don't actually get you don't know uh, digital uh, kind of uh, advertising but how did you actually then manage to get the respects of your staff who actually in and know everything about digital marketing because, because their managers them the people who run the nhs aren't doctors the people who yeah. run the nhs are business people and they have doctors who manage the doctors they have consultants who manage the doctors. So my, I'm the CEO of the company. My job is to be a businessman. I have experts in SEO who manage the SEO team. I have experts in websites who manage my website team. So my job, again, is surrounding myself with people who really know what they're doing. I know nothing about accounts. That's for my accountant. And that's that's what being a business person is all about, is having the pride to say, I'm interested in that, but I'm not an expert. And let me find a person who is. You, you, if you try to become an expert in care, I think that's a problem because you'll get exposed. If I go around and start telling a person I'm an expert in care, I, I, I'm in huge trouble. I'm not. I'm, I'm really not an expert in care, but I can have that e I can pull the person into my business that is so it's promoting the people in your business with the right skill set and listen if you're if the staff think they're so good to do it go and tell them to go and do it themselves you know it, it's hard to start a business to take the risk to have the courage to build a business you're welcome to go and work for yourself or you can come and work with a team that's really passionate about helping people with uh, underneath the lady who has all of the years of experience okay hope, hope. Hopefully that helped. That that did answer your question. Hey, and you got sorry. Could I just so, ask a question? Of course you can, Katrina. Um, Fitri, do you do you listen to the people that are saying the things that they're saying to you about childcare? Uh, in what way? 
if they're saying you don't know anything about childcare, um, are you listening to what they're saying to you? Do you have meetings with them so that they can, if you, you admitted you don't have any background in care, that there's quite a lot involved in taking care of children. So do you listen to what they're saying to you um, and take their advice if that's what they do? I'm guessing that Mark, if he's in, employed at SEO, he doesn't then try to tell them that they don't know what they're doing. Um, he will listen to them because that's why he's employed them. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is in a way that, you know, because obviously they know what, how, how to actually run the homes, um, you know, in, in, in the way that how, how they are, um, their inputs and everything else. So I do listen to, because it's not just me, isn't it? Because it's my other clinical director. I don't really kind of run the whole of the company. It's more kind of um the the operational side the training who side, does run it then who, who does run the homes so they they will be in will be the registered manager who run the home but the way we i think what we're trying to do is here is it, when we actually uh, sell our business or service to the commissioners because that's that's who we're actually working with which is the, the government and the co commissioners mm -hmm. and uh, children's services so we're trying to do something totally different than what is the existing um children home are uh, the service that we do is not the standard box service that children home around the country have so, so yours is different where have you taken the advice from to, to start something different presuming so something in childcare yeah so basically my um partners um, you know, my, my the clinical director, she had a home before. The service that we're going to offer is, you know, we, we talk to commissioners and we look at what they need. What is the gap in the in the industry? What is the problem? Why the children are keep coming back onto the systems um, and, and things like that? So we look at all of the current um, issues within within the industry. And then obviously this is we found a gap where there is a, a service that is not being kind of offered to the children's services, which is the systemic approach where we did the, the because at the end of the day, this is a business. You have to make money. You, you want it, you know, wanted the kind of return customer in a way. But what we're trying to do is to stop that returning customer because there's too, it's too many children's in in this kind of a children home and and stuff like that okay. so, we, I, so that's I what am, we do it's okay i am going to draw a line under that, that sorry that was my fault no no that's absolutely fine and it's not and do you know what i really love about this is is this is kind of what peer networks are about it's about having that ability to challenge and be challenged you know and, and the only reason why i'm drawing a line under it is because actually we, we haven't got the opportunity today to really no, no, dig into fine. things like that but it's what peer networks are all about. And I'm loving the fact that you're already in a situation where you're willing to challenge and be challenged, um, which is absolutely fantastic. But what I am going to say is between Katrina, Elizabeth and Mark, do you have any questions for Mark? While well, we've got him. Um, Mark, Mark Barrett, it seems yeah. to have come off mute. Can't well, see I, you, Mark. I, I came off mute basically because I need to drop off the line. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd better say hello if nothing else. Um, I thought it was quite quite useful to have the the, the chat uh, that that Mark gave, uh, and it's it's quite uh, what's the best word to describe it? Quite straightforward what he's saying. It's most of this is common sense, and um, it's actually implementing things in the right way and being consistent with people and how you treat others. You know, you you, you want to be. Um, direct but also you need to get people working with you and for you in, in, a, in a constructive way and I think this is part of the challenge that we all have when you become a manager or a leader is is this balance between task and um, what people like to call uh, I think I'm, I can't remember the word myself now but you know the, the, the sort of uh, there's, there's two types of manager basically one who inspires and one who basically focuses on the tasks and I think there's a, there's a blend in that of, of that with both with all of us mm. uh, to get the best out of out of our teams um, and I, I suspect that uh, Mark started off being very task orientated and has now become incredibly uh, less task and more um, 
inspirational, I would suggest, is the way that he now tries to bring teams forward and develop people. I just share that from a point of view of the, the group as a whole as much as anything else. I don't I say I need to drop off the line in, in literally a couple of minutes, but I just wanted to share that thought in terms of the balance between how you react and build relationships with people, whether it be customers or, or employees, etc. Thanks very much indeed for that, Mark. So Katrina and Elizabeth, I'm going to offer you the opportunity to ask Mark a question. I'll ask him a question. Um, for a small business, what would you say the best marketing um, avenue would be? It's, it's, it's really, uh, that's a good question because it depends a lot on the business and, and the product, but generally speaking, Google Ads is the, is the first and foremost uh, place we start because it has the most direct return. So uh, one of the questions I often get is, do I need a website anymore because social media has improved so much? Uh, the answer is yes, you always need to invest in a good website. Uh, uh, generally speaking, if you're a service-based business, a WordPress website, and if you're a product-based business, doing a, a e-com website through Shopify would be sufficient initially before moving to WooCommerce. Every uh, 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 website, once it's established, needs SEO, but the best two places to start would be Google Ads, and SEO and having free social media initially until you're in a place where you can pay to advertise. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Elizabeth, do we have a question from you or? Shall hi, we? hi, oh, yes, 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 finally I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I've been listening. Um, basically, so 978 Finance, we're obviously in the finance world, which, um, you know, it can be, quite analytical and, you know, a non-sophisticated non market. And, you know, we, we're working hard on building that comfort behind the brand, but there is a risk that that glossiness, that shine, that shiny look to the brand can put people off. And I was just sort of basically... I wanted to see what Mark's views are on that, you know, like how can you build that brand comfort in the financial market? Um, who, who would you say it puts off the glossiness? Um, well, you know, sort of people like sharks, because there, there's a lot of sharks in the sort of, you know, world of finance. Yeah. So you're an investment, are you an investment company then? You, you take. So yes, yes, we do investment, um, you know, lending. We also do uh, property management. Uh, so we do the full chain really. Okay. Are you FCA regulated? Not at present, but we are currently, uh, you know, we're going through the application process, which is uh, taken quite a long time. Um, maybe because of you know covid and things but um yeah we're hoping to to get the application finalized yeah, I, I, yeah I mean i get asked a lot of talks about um investments and i think the key thing that people are looking out for before they're making investment is is it a trustworthy is it a trustworthy intermediary and what would trustworthy look like having excellent reviews from customers customer testimonial making sure that the uh, the investments themselves are th thoroughly investigated and legitimate and i would never invest with a company that's not fca um, regulated or or working through a uh, an fca regulatory uh, vehicle so the, the, they're the they're the areas that we advise people on heavily and and that's super important is just making sure because so many people have had their hands burnt with these canary wharf agents that are unregulated they t sell you the dream of these crazy uh, returns and then your money disappears um, so it's super important that the uh, the investments are legitimate that there's uh, testimonials from previous success stories um, and and th there's that protection there if it's first charge over over assets or an insurance to the to the uh, investor that's the ones that do the most successful your website and and um, uh, has to do a lot of heavy lifting because there's a lot of regulation around finance 
finance uh, in advertising perspective. So mm -hmm. SEO is a great place. Your website's got to do a lot of heavy lifting and videos, testimonial videos and videos walking through the investments on social media, driving back um, to, to the website. But this is, I get asked so much about um, how, who to trust and how to trust investments. And unfortunately, it's a bit of a, it's a tough uh, place to navigate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah that's that, really helpful get that fca regulation is all i will say to you that's so so, so important mm -hmm, mm -hmm. great thank you thank My you very pleasure. much well thank you very much we had some questions or comments from everybody so that's a hundred percent i think it's a small group but that's the best response rate we've had from the whole group for a while <laughs> <laughs> so thanks guys <laughs> you've hit the high spots from 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 one point um Thank you, Mark. It's always I say, it's always brilliant yes, thank to, you. to hear from yeah. you. Yeah, and thank I, you very I, much. Thank you. My pleasure. It's always I, great I, to have your input. Thank you for um, having me back. And I wish you all the very best with your businesses. And I, I do hope you join um, th this business network because I certainly enjoy being part of it. <laughs> great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Mark. Okay. I was going to say, I'm going to hand over to Kevin now. And and Mark, I know if you you know I know your time is precious. If you are able to stay uh, a little bit longer, that would be that would be great. But if not, we understand the. I'm just going to present something that I'd love your love your thoughts on, actually. So if you are able to stay for a little bit, I can stay be, uh, for ten fantastic. minutes. If that's yeah, okay. perfect. That's yeah. that's all. That's all it would be. Brilliant. Good. So yeah, thank thank you very much for that. So um, we're we're at this point of the of, of the agenda. We're going to start moving towards uh, towards finishing things off, wrapping things up now. I'm going to talk just a little bit about scale up challenges and something called unconscious bias because it links very much into into the peer networks. Mark's already hint, hinted about it a, a little bit already. Um, something that we've that we've recently done also is um, some, some research around the challenges that business owners face when scaling up and those challenges of of creating a seven figure business success. And I'm not going to go through the whole report around it, but uh, but I would like to just tease out a couple of things because essentially the peer network groups that we're running are around really helping businesses and business owners to scale up so uh, you know we want to cover some of those some of those things mark's already mentioned a couple of statistics um but you know you may or may not know that in this country 99.3 percent of businesses do not scale beyond 49 employees and in fact, only 4% scale beyond nine employees. So in other words, 90, 96% of businesses in this country have nine or fewer uh, employees. And we want to explore some of the reasons for this because they, they do provide a big contribution to the economy and everything. But um, you know, why is it that, that, not, that more businesses do not scale up? And you know, obviously not everybody wants to, and that's absolutely fine. But are those that, those that do? And um, one or two things that just might be interesting is this idea of the scale up, scale up journey. And there are various stepping stones within that journey. Uh, it's not a smooth line. It's not a not even a, a wiggly up and down line. There are a series of stepping stones at which the business can operate really well. And we've kind of got to almost go for plan going from one stepping stone to the next. And the numbers on here are in terms of employees, three to five, eight, eight, eight to twelve. And what what we've got here underneath are um, some of the key strategic things we need to focus on, key leadership focus, and the biggest challenges that have come out from that scale-up challenge report. Now, I know there's a lot on here, and I'll take you through it very, very briefly. Um, the real revenue here, Mark mentioned don't focus on revenue, and that is why we call this is real revenue. It's essentially the gross profit. So if you've got a business that only makes 50% gross profit, then that's what this number is. So these businesses could be turning over um, maybe double double this in some in some cases could be could be more than that um, but uh, this is the the gross profit line and the typical sort of employee numbers that these these represent and initially then it's around the product market fit and making sure we've got a scalable business model and it's about rolling our sleeves up it's about getting down and dirty and we are going to be doing you know um, the mark that mark barrett um that left early um was mentioned the fact about mark's Mark's focus has probably changed from being the tactical um, to, to being a bit more strategic. When we get to that next one and these valleys in death, valleys of death in between, we've got to be very careful about how we navigate those. But when we're looking at sort of three to five employees and getting getting beyond that, 
we need to make sure we've got a reliable, repeatable and scalable lead generation route. So Mark was talking very much about that to give us that required level of new customers. And the focus as a, from a leader should be on where we add value most. So that's when we need to start to delegate all the things that we're not so good at, that we shouldn't be doing, that, that detract from where we can add most value and specialize in the, within the business and not trying to do everything ourselves within the, within the whole business. And the biggest challenge from the scale-up report across those two areas are typically getting dragged back into day-to-day -day operations, but also generating those sufficient quality leads. So those are the sort of things we need to really be working on there. When we're moving towards this next stepping stone of um, getting beyond the eight to 12, we now start to need to really be thinking uh, and, and getting from the three to five to eight to 12 around systems and processes. And Mark, again, was talking about that is making sure that we've documented everything and that we that doesn't just rely on us and the expertise in our heads, but also some of our key individual members of staff's heads is not just in their heads. And the focus there from a leadership point of view is around making the business essentially a turnkey type type business and the biggest challenge from the scout report here which goes across a few is attracting and hiring the right kind of people and getting staff to think and act in a way and be responsible in a way that we'd want as business owners and then so on as we as we as we move up through then it becomes much more around the people uh, getting the leadership team developing leaders behind us developing other leaders uh, the role challenge is supporting and getting staff to think and act responsibly for themselves so um, and then once we get beyond that, it's around starting to then protect the business and make sure that we've got all the IP in place, but also putting up defensive walls and barriers around our what makes us what makes us different. And Mark was talking about becoming an ambassador in that business. And you're, you're, no, you're now really selling the business. You're not selling the products and services of the business. You're selling the overall image of the business and you're out there getting getting known. And but still what we need to what the challenges that come out through the scale up report are around getting staff to think and act take responsibility for them for themselves but managing the right things consistently well going to be able to do the right things and do them uh, consistently well so that's just a very quick quick overview of that but i want to talk something to do with peer networks i want to talk about those 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 biases but also the unconscious mind because um our unconscious minds are absolutely phenomenal and amazing and they can process, their unconscious mind can process vastly more information than our conscious mind uh, and, and, and much quicker. And it does that by using shortcuts. Uh, and But those shortcuts are built up over time. The way our brain works is building those up over time through things like our culture and environment, the way we've been brought up, personal experiences, all of those things to make very quick, rapid decisions about everything around us. The snag is that that can be wrong quite a lot of the time. So sometimes it's great, sometimes it's absolutely right, but it can, can be wrong, especially on matters that need a little bit of rational thinking. And if I give you this classic example of a bat and a ball that cost one pound and 10 pence together, if I then tell you that the bat costs one pound more than the ball, how much does the ball cost? Any quick, quick answers, top of your mind? I wasn't concentrating. <laughs> Anybody? Nope. Well, the normal number that jumps to mind is, is 10 pence. Most, more than half people come straight away to say that it's 10 pence. Well, the actual answer is five pence. But the reason we come up with 10 is that that's the information we got very quickly. Our brain makes quick connections with shortcuts and it's fallible. So um, let's look at some of the reasons behind that and some of the other ideas of bias then as we go, as we go through, which might be, uh, certainly I found them a little bit interesting when I was putting them together. So uh, uh, this is about um, this is about applications with a for a job with a British sounding name, which might be quite interesting. So they the people put together a group. People put together some standard CVs, gave the put the name at the top as a standard English sounding name, and of those CVs, twenty four percent got positive response rate. They then changed the names. To be so nothing else but they just changed the names to be non-british sounding name obviously this this study was done in 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 britain with so they had identical cvs and cover notes and, and everything as before now that 24 percent that got a positive response dropped to 15 so nothing else had changed just the name on the on the cv so there's one one type of bias and this is linked to this one is accents 
So and I was having a chat with Mark about this uh, earlier on. And, um, you know, there was a study done with hiring managers across the UK to see if there was a negative bias towards regional accents. And 80% of hiring managers admitted to having a bias against regional accents. And the main accents were London, which I think was mainly the Cockney, Cockney accent, um, but also accents such as from Liverpool, from Birmingham, which is, uh, yes, yeah, so from Birmingham, from Newcastle and Glasgow were the typical accents that, that had the most negative discrimination um, associated with them. And also, if we've got an ingrained belief about something, we later seek evidence to, to support this. And Mark mentioned this a little bit as, as well. But if, if, you, if, if you've got a particular feeling, an ingrained belief, like, for example, you might at the beginning of lockdown, you might have believed that certain individuals or whatever couldn't possibly work effectively from home. Well, then what happens is we see the behavior and that gets reinforced. And we might, and that, that then confirms our belief that Jack can't work remotely, work, work from home. Whereas if somebody else in the, in, in, that we know in the office maybe does the same sort of thing, we're, we're less likely to um, actually uh, see that as, a, a, as an issue. So we kind of justify our response um, um, uh, or to that and might think it's just a, just a one-off. Attractive people. So um, another, another study, what do, what, do you, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think? Do you think um, attractive people or people that are rated as attractive make more or less money over their lifetime than people more. that might be defined as non-attractive? More. Yeah. <laughs> So, so apparently, people who are rated as, as being, a, being attractive make £250,000 more over their lifetime than non-attractive people. How's, how's that? Right? I, I, don't know, I don't know how they define attractive and non-attractive, but you know, we could have a long debate about that. But you know, simply what you look like has an impact on, uh, on, on your success, apparently. There's, there's something called, um, we can also influence bias. So this is, a, this is around influence. My, and this you know, was reminded by a mate of mine. He told me that he'd, he'd just paid 3,000 pounds for a table and chairs. And I kind of went, what? You know, that's a load of money, right? But when he'd gone to see this table and chairs, it was up at 9,000 pounds in the showroom, right? And over a period of time, the salesman, and in lockdown and whatever else, you know, all, all those sort of reasons, eventually I sold it to him for 3,000. So as far as my friend was concerned, he'd saved 6,000 pounds. As far as I was concerned, he'd spent 3,000 pounds on a bloody table and chairs, which is horrible. <laughs> but, but anyway, so you can, you can influence the, 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 the bias and you see this all the time in marketing. You see headline rates for stuff, um, but then but because they position you, they're, they're positioning you as, okay, it's worth that. So if you can get it for a bit less, you think you've got a real, a real bargain, but there's all sorts of other biases ar ar around, around that. So that's the employee, you know, that's the kind of uh, that, that side of things. But if you think about, um, there's, all, there's also um, this one around, um, around whether things are fake or, or fact, fact news. And you see a lot of this going on on social media and you saw Donald Trump doing it a hell, a hell of a lot. Uh, he's, he's trying to put across that, this is fact, and he put his view view across. He's trying to influence our decisions again, so that when we when we see something, we, we're basing it on that on that in our in our in our minds. So that was just a little bit of a little bit of a background, really, to um, to um, to some biases. And one of the things within peer networks, of course, is because we've all got we've all got these biases. Most of them are, uh, you know, the unconscious biases. Some of them, some of them we might recognise. But one of the things that we see within the peer networks is that we are able to challenge each of those biases as we as, as we go through. So, and business is around making good business decisions. And if we're full of unconscious biases, we're not making the best decisions. Sometimes they'll be right. Sometimes they'll be they'll, they'll be wrong, and if we've got a group of people that can ask us those awkward questions, and it's great because just a moment ago we saw a little bit of a, a little bit of that. Katrina was asking Fitri about 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 various things, and with a gentle, challenging approach, we're just questioning some of those things. Katrina, I'm guessing, is not an expert in the care in the care market. I and do have is, I do have a background in care. Oh, you do have a background yeah, as well. Okay, great, <laughs> but but you don't have to be because. What, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're bringing in our other experiences and we're then challenging some of those assumptions that we all go, well, that's how it works in my industry. You know, I can't do anything different because that's just the way it is. Well, 
why and, and mark was mark was absolutely challenging some of that thinking earlier earlier on as well we have to ask ourselves why if we don't think that's right or we think it can be done better then we need to need to be challenged on that if we're not going to challenge us, ourselves on it so i'm going to just come back to the m and m m's just to just to bring that uh, bring that home if you like at the beginning why well, I, asked, I asked you how many how many there were in in there, and um, I've got I've got your answers. You don't you don't you don't know each know each other's, but I wonder um, what I'm not going to what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to labour the point. I'm going to going to show you the results because only there's only a few of us, and I think it would just be a little bit torturous to, to to go through it. But the way that this exercise has been done with thousands of people, and it's not it's not our exercise. It's done at one of the top business schools in in the world called called INSEAD, which is a French French business school. It's um it consistently ranks one or two in in in, in the world on on MBAs and executive um, programs. And they do this exercise with all of the new groups when they when they when they come in. And the process is you do an individual estimate of how many you think there are in the jar. You then work in a small group of six or seven people and you come to a group uh, what you think as a group now, so you've one number for that for that group, but you've had a chance to discuss it, and then you, you're asked to revise your individual estimate as well. Okay, and let me just show you the sort of the, the results then that have that have come through. So the real answer was 846. So um, congratulations to Elizabeth, you you got the closest. Um, so well 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 done to Woo, you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> With a, with, with a thousand. But then also we can see that the range, so Katrina 250 and Fitri at uh, 2600, then, and, and this is, what, this is what, what happens. If we look at the individual error, then there can be a big error from that 846. If we then have a group discussion about it, that group error comes right down to almost a third um, of, of what that error is. So simply by discussing it, other people saying, well, you know, Elizabeth, how did you get at a thousand? And, and talking talking that through influences our decisions, but we end up coming to a, to a better decision as a group. But not only that, the the revised individual error then, when people are then ask, okay, well, would you change your first estimate from the from the number that you had? So if we asked um, Katrina, would you change your two fifty, and Fitri, would you change your two thousand six hundred, and Elizabeth, would you change your thousand? Then what happens is that our individual decision is still is now better. It's not quite as good as the group decision because some of us won't change and all of, all, all of those, but overall it's better than the first decision that we made simply by discussing it. And none of us are experts on how many M&Ms there are in a, in a jar, <laughs> but I, I don't think. Um, maybe some of us are, that's, uh, that's, your, that's your, your fancy, but um, that's, that's the point. And I think it illustrates, it's a very simple, very simplistic example but it illustrates one of the powers of, of peer networks and uh, and of group group discussions. And when you combine that with the unconscious biases, and then you overlay it with what we do around the scale up journey, then you're starting to think about okay, well, how does this all go back into business? How do we create better businesses? How do we work together ongoing to help to make better business decisions at the at the end of the day? So I think that's all I wanted to say on on that. Any any questions on that before we before we just quickly move on and talk about the program? Any thoughts? No, I just think that's a good analogy. Hey, yeah, very good. Mark, what were your what were your thoughts? Man, I I, I love it because it just was reminding me also the table that you had of your friends that was. 3000 and he got it for nine there's these studies that are like easyjet and ryanair have published where they offer a flight out for 29 pounds for example and you buy that flight and you go on skyscanner and you look for the cheapest flight and you pay 20 quid for the flight and then you take 150 pound uber to the airport and the, the theory is, is once you've committed to any level of expenditure, be it one yeah. pound to 20, you've opened up your mind to, for, yeah. you then get on the plane and spend, you know, 150 quid on champagne and you've caught an Uber there. And that cheap flight is now 500 quid, which yeah. you could have got with BA and had the chauffeur to the airport and whatever. But it's tricking your mind into purchasing um, behavior patterns. And it's, I find this stuff so fascinating. And if you can Domino is, I think, is a great example. My my boys, I've got three three 
well they're not boys really anymore um but they love dominoes how expensive is a bloody domino's yeah. pizza if you buy one pizza what is it 20 20 yeah. quid or something isn't it yeah. all right but they think dominoes are the best pizzas out and of course you get a fantastic deal if you buy two or something you get it for 11 quid each i mean it's still bloody expensive <laughs> but this is it these guys are masters of behavioral science and purchasing science and uh i was just thinking about looking at even the m m's as a crazy example but i'll have a really difficult thing in my business which i think i know the answer by the time i walked out of our board meeting my opinion of what to do has completely changed because yep. the group has shown me an alternative position, which I didn't even, I couldn't even see before engaging the issue. Yeah. Um, powerful stuff. But I've, I've got to shoot, but I just wanted to thank you, Kevin and Louise and everyone for, for having me again this afternoon. I, I wish you all the best. Thank, thank you, Mark. You. That's thank fantastic. You. Really appreciate thank it. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> right, Louise, I think you just want to say a couple of words about the programme. Um, I do. And actually, you know, it's almost as though we planned it because Mark's lead into, <laughs> into what we're going to say next was really rather good. So let me just share the screen and, and I will literally run through this really quickly for you guys. But it's just getting you to understand, you know, what's next. And so what about the programme? So um, just in terms of the peer networks and what you can expect and what you'll get. Um, you'll get a lot more challenging like we have today and you'll get a lot more uh, wide thinking and you'll you'll get these different views from different people um we deliver them through the through a series of, of they are themed to a to a point and we take you on a journey here so many of the things that in in fact that um mark has talked about today we'll explore them in a little bit more detail and work out how they apply to your business we'll also take you through some great benchmarking exercises that you can keep running year on year that will help you to really hone those business skills I mean, this is a national peer-to-peer -peer networking program, and it's for SME leaders who want to grow and develop um, your business for, for future success. And it's funded by central government. So all this program comes to you for free, which actually, perhaps, Kevin, we ought to be thinking about charging for this, yeah. given Mark's view. Yep. Um, what we've got here is it's 18 hours of fully funded group facilitated learning and three and a half hours of fully funded one-to-one -one time with a facilitator. So we will have trained facilitators like, like Kevin and I running the group um, and you'll get one-to-one -one time with us as well as that, that group interaction and that group learning. It is very flexible um, and it, we will focus a lot on what it means and what's important for your business. This isn't a training program, for instance that you go through and you have to learn certain things. This is very much dictated by following a structured program of thinking, but, but really focusing on what it is for your, for your business. So that is that side of it. And essentially just what we're talking about, overcoming the business challenges, building that trusted network of connections and improving the long-term personal and business performance. We know it works because we've been working with people for a long time on peer networks um, and we've seen amazing um, changes in businesses uh, just through working on these peer-to-peer -peer programs. And it, it just reminded me of what we've been talking about now is, you know, when we get those, the, 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 the important thing about the groups that we run is that they will be diverse. We don't like to have like businesses in the room at the same time because we want those different viewpoints. We started a peer network last week, didn't we, Kevin? And I remember sitting there and everybody was looking around the room and you can see them even on Zoom looking around the room and making unconscious and conscious decisions about who they were and the value of them to the, to the business or to them. And then we started to investigate who these businesses were and what they did. And it was utterly, utterly fascinating. And by the time we had finished that first session, everybody was fully engaged and realised that they'd got a huge opportunity. We had a music producer who lost Black Sabbath to the competition in London. And we had a guy who was making and, and de developing hydrogen powered engines for trains. And just the gelling of those groups together was, was just amazing to watch. And, and that's what we love about delivering peer networks. Um, and that's why I would encourage you um, and anybody else you know out there to come and join us because it, it it'll be fun it'll be educational and it'll be great for the business 
These are the dates, um, obviously for peer networks, there are set dates for the, um, for the peer networks, the group working themselves. They don't move, okay? We, we fit in the one-to-ones between, but these are immovable objects because they're, they're set, the whole idea is you commit to a peer network and you come um, and participate in that peer network on those days. Um, there will be one-to-ones in between. And as part of the program, it's not, uh, it's not a required part of the program, but it's something that we do a lot is the smart 90, 90 day planning workshops. We've got two of them that fit within this program window. So you will get the opportunity to come to either one or both of those uh, and work on the quarterly planning, um, which you'll learn more about in the third session, but um, you're very welcome to come along to those as well. Criteria, well, the criteria are operated for at least a year, have at least two employees, turn over 100,000, but above all, an aspiration to improve. If you are unsure whether you fit, okay, don't just turn around and say, I don't seem to fit, ask us the question. You know, make, have that conversation with us because operated for at least a year, um, there are different starting points for businesses. So, you know, when did you register your company? When did you start trading? There are all sorts of things we can look at and think about to, um, to get you uh, on board. The potential to scale up um, and the, the ability to export would be great, um, but they are not essential parts of this business. Essentially, it's, it's the aspiration to improve. So um, what do we want you to do about it? Well, what we would like you to do is um, either say that you um, are in or out or would like more information. There is um, a, an expression of interest form which link, which Caroline has just posted in the uh, chat. Um, and if you could click on that before you leave today, that would be absolutely brilliant. If you haven't already filled in a, an expression of interest form, and I know some of you may well have done that. Just click on that link and open it up so that you've got it open um, if you want to, to commit to this. Um, you know, you've all been brilliant and, and engaged and challenged and challenging today. So I think it would be great to have you all on the, um, on the program with us. So open that up and um, hopefully we will be able to follow that through with you. Kevin, would you like to add anything else? Uh, no, I think that's I think that's that's perfect. And as Louise says, the first best thing is have a conversation, and then we can work through uh, work work through it all with you. So the other thing is, if you would like to hang on at the end and ask us any more questions about it, um, or ask us to help you with that uh, the registration or the expression of interest, please stay on at the end. Um, and essentially, that is us. Um, completed for today, but I would like to leave you with just this one thought, which is coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress and working together is success. Funnily enough, peer networks is not the new thing that everything, everybody talks about. Um, Henry Ford was talking about this kind of thing at the beginning of the last century, never mind this one. So hopefully you will be available to join us. And that is us done for today.